on the several trips that I made up to death row to deliver cookies that my wife had made, I met a man, Devin Bennett, and recognized pretty quick that he was a Christian brother. We had some good fellowship up there, and I learned about some of the ministry that goes on um, on J Block, which is death row there at Parchman. I was able to get Devin out for an interview, and I thought that he had a very interesting perspective. And so it was a privilege to be able to interview Devin, and I hope that you'll listen closely to some of the things that Devin has got to say. So straight from death row at Parchman Penitentiary, this is our interview with Devin Bennett. This is Bobby with Christ Song, and we're still here at Parchman, Mississippi State Penitentiary, and I'm here with Devin Bennett today, and I got to talk with Devin sitting here before this interview, and he told me that he liked, you know, y'all know I'm a songwriter. Well, um, Mr. Devin here is also a word man, wordsmith, and he has shared some words with me. And so instead of him sharing them with me, I'm going to him share them with you guys. So Devin, if you feel comfortable, brother, bless him. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Devin, uh, and I wrote this testimony shortly after I came to Christ. And um, it came in about the span of about six or seven days. And so uh, um, this, this is it. Bear with me if uh, mistakes are made. Uh, my problem started in the womb through the drugs mom used. I came out jaded on the 11th of June. It was 1980. Since that day, life continued to get crazy. Had a rough start. Both parents, they had problems. Divorced when I was born and problems, they couldn't solve them. Started out with mom, madness in the kitchen. Drugs took over. Soon we were both victims. When she OD'd, they found her by a table. The medics brought her back, but that environment's unstable. Now I'm with dad, another house, not a home. Getting smacked around whenever I did wrong. Drugs and drinking, all hours of night. Chaos and violence, I rarely slept tight. Next few years, I seen more of the same. Till mom in 86 said it's time for a change. Start of first grade, my mom seemed stable. Working at the bar, making tips off tables. Wasn't until 87, the good turned bad. Mama started drinking, and happy it turned sad. Liquor by the bed, pills in the glove box. Late night drunk fights, they broke my lunchbox. Had the He-Man edition, castle of gray skull. A gift from mom for another lie, she told. Angry with my mom, this life we were living. Seeing her having sex for drugs, money, and attention. Warping my perspective in the way I seen a mother. Instead of being a mother, she was being someone's lover. Men touching on her, examples being shown. As they led, I followed, not knowing it was wrong. She pushed me away, I felt pain and rejection. Feelings that affect later as they manifested. Fast forward, 89, mom overdosed again. Them lights everywhere, my mom barely breathing. Like deja vu, how I'm seeing what I'm seeing. Again, it's back with my dad, the paramedics leaving. Now it's NA meetings, I just turned nine. Still remember being hyper, drinking coffee inside. With my dad and his girl sober, things started out cool. But with all the back and forth, now I'm struggling in school. Wanting to be accepted, acting out in class. Got in a lot of trouble, my grades are really bad. Running away from home in the middle of fourth grade. Stepmoms was abusive in them streets I stayed. Dad started using, my behavior didn't help. Behaviors the expressing all the feelings I felt. Pain, fear, and anger, I was hurting deep inside. When I was 10 years old, I started getting high. Summer 92, went to reform school. Breaking in car lots, still trying to be cool. There I tried new things, wanting acceptance and love. But sexual acts with a boy just made me more mindful of. Not knowing who I was, I felt worthless and ashamed. These feelings weren't my fault, but still I blamed. Got out in 94, dad drinking and drugging, mom still missing in action. Now I'm living with a cousin, had a brand new start. He let me make myself at home, but I wore out the welcome. I was still doing wrong. Skipping school, stealing, smoking weed in the crib. Why is it always later? We see how stupid we is. Finally found what I needed, but I ain't accepted. I grew tired of second guessing, so I chose to reject it. Mid-95, still on the wrong road. Primos with Chico, putting graffiti on walls. In them streets, wild and refusing to follow rules. Got busted selling dope by an undercover near school. Sent me to rehab, told me get my life together. Yet in spite of the advice, poor choices, they continue. In and out of detention, rehab and group homes. Spirit of rebellion, head harder than a stone. Running from police, I was running for myself. Called me a wannabe, I wanted to be someone else. Living a life of insanity, hurting the people trying to help. Summer 99 is when I met my son's mother, unlike any other, far from a lover. With her I felt amazing, I had finally found the one, but because I wouldn't change, I messed a good thing up. Afraid she'd leave, got her pregnant in October, making things a lot worse, I wasn't ready to be a father. Over the next nine months, I continued to do me, hurt myself and those closest, living selfishly, front like I was something, but really life was bleak, day to day aspirations, money, sex, and weed. June 2000, before my son came, I was in an accident, left me in a coma for two days. The day I came out, my son Brandon was born. The amount of love he brought money could never afford. It was time to invest. My son needed his dad, so I invested in help with the problems I had. 
went to a court day to charge from 99, told the judge I needed help, wanted to change my life, to be the dad my son deserves and do this dad thing right. He ordered me the treatment, said I'd leave in a month, giving me time to say goodbye and spend time with my son. Things weren't good. I seemed to struggle with our weed. It's like I needed to be high just to keep my mind at ease. I was angry and impulsive, having mood swings. Still, what would happen next would be my deepest regret. After all these years, it's still hard to express. What happened wasn't intentional. Still, my actions were wrong. Whether intentional or not, it's my fault. He's gone. When they asked what happened, I spoke lies instead of truth. Because of this and his condition, they charged child abuse. I was sitting in jail when my son passed away. Charged with murder, I couldn't attend my son's wake. Made bail a month later, but I was still in chains. But the chains that remained were the guilt and the pain. Causing my anger and addiction to do more of the same. It made my dad, get girl, and family further victims of my pain. Yet in spite of my wretched heart, God, he reached out to me. In 2003, his hand was a form of a plea. 20 years or a death sentence, the choice to decide. Would I accept God's hand or continue on in my lives? Held captive by fear, I was unwilling to deal. I ignored God's hand, the ugly truth I concealed. Trial started a week later. New lies, they arrived. I had my chance of justice, but I chose to decline. After the verdict, they sentenced me to death, which really didn't even matter. See, I was already dead. Two months later, my dad died of heart failure. Then mom from suicide less than nine months later. After my dad died, came more guilt and pain. Since 94, he tried to love me, but in return, I gave him pain. The lying and the stealing, making him my mark. My dad died of heart failure because I broke his heart. These losses in my life pushed me further into darkness, so I stuck to what gave me light even though it never lasted. Over the next nine years, my demons became smarter. Each day was a test and the tests were getting harder. At the school of self-destruction, lessons are insane. I was covering guilt and pain with dirt from my own grave. In 2012, I went on a hunger strike, protesting conditions and constitutional rights. After 19 days, I was broken and on my knees, found myself looking for God I really needed to believe. Over the next nine months, I stayed in transition till I heard that sermon on Urban by Miles McPherson calling all listeners to a 40-day fast. Since then, I heard the same voice I'd heard in the past, let go of the lies and surrender it all to God. But how, when I was still afraid to confess what I'd done, still a fast began, all things secular, no TV or music, no books or magazines. Still, I'd spend time in the Word daily giving God the lead. I started in Matthew, but it was in the book of John that God gave strength I need to overcome the problem. That's when nightmares started, the thoughts of suicide. That's the first night the demons came to my bedside. But the next six nights they paid me a visit Bringing the past with them, forcing me to relive it My dad and my family, my baby mom and my son Gave a front row seat to all the evil I had done Satan trying to keep me I'd been here before and I knew the only way of escape Was surrender to the Lord Heavy laden with pain and chains of guilt, fear and shame but it was there in my despair I found the strength he gave. As I reached in his love, he pulled in his mercy. And as soon as I reached, the chains were broken off me. I was set free, resurrected to new life by the grace, love, and mercy of God and Jesus Christ. Through the power of the Spirit, he's bringing transformation while allowing me and Christ to work out my salvation. Because I accept Christ don't mean problems disappear. It means I'm an overcomer, no longer bound by fear. He's building new bridges over a few I burn while giving me consolation that allows me to endure. The consolation he gives, it serves a twofold purpose, that I may be a light of life to all those that are still hopeless, all I endure, lets me be more things to man, through which Christ shines the light of life now living within. His glory is in my story, that's why I'm sharing it with the world. I pray the hope and love of Jesus Christ reaches every boy and girl. Man, my brother. Man, it's heaven, brother. But it's deep, you hear me? Straight it's deep from life. here. Straight deep from there. <laughs> I call it. It's my life. I mean, I God is faithful. Like, if there's anything, like, like the stuff I've done in my life, like, it doesn't matter those things like God didn't see any of that well actually no he did see that and in spite of that he still loved me yeah. and that is what I want people to, to understand regardless of how wretched and selfish I was and the things that I did I understand that I'm here for a purpose I understand that justice wasn't served by me taking that plea that I had to come here for me to be broken and be where he needed me to be to get what he has to give me Amen. like I knew that no. uh, well I know that now I didn't know that right. then right in hindsight, you know that now. All that, you know, being yeah, 20, you know, 20. Been dead and that and then never got a chance at the rest right, of that. So, so you would trip. Brother, uh, Bobby here with Christ Song. We didn't say this when we started this interview, but <coughs> obviously this brother's words you just heard aren't something he made up. You heard him say this is his life. Um, he just a few minutes ago was brought off a of death row and brought over here to the conference room where we now sit and are doing this interview. Um, so what you heard was straight from the brother's heart, straight in the life he lived. One thing about a lot of us that have done long-term incarceration and been involved is, is it starts with our childhoods. 
when when you started talking about childhood, mine brother the same way was off the chain, violent, abusive, a war torn dad that from World War II and Korea, post traumatic stress, um, white liquor, mountains of North Carolina, the poor people, you know the rest of it. Right, right. Just cursed and I never thought that um, we we weren't churchgoers. Um, I'd heard a virgin out of child, that's all I needed to right, hear. Right. I didn't believe the gospel. Right. And so after all these years, I was finally, I came to a place to where I was hoping there was going to be something different. The hole in here had gotten so big that I couldn't shoot enough dope, couldn't get high enough to fill that hole up. That and some of my aim, some of my um, um, behavior that was exhibiting was turning extremely angry. Right. And I thought today, before I come over here to sit with you, brother, is that um, we could have traded places yes. if things were known as everything was known. You feel me? Right. Right. So with that said, it was kind of heavy for me to come over here. I talked to you. This is the third time I've been on the road mm -hmm. talking to you twice. In fact, uh, my wife made you peanut butter cookies. Yeah, and they were good too. <laughs> they were good. Yeah, tell, tell, tell sister that we yeah. made that. I'm appreciative of that. We appreciate yeah. that. that. No was problem, brother. Good. We love to do you that right good. there. Yeah, you eat good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, with me and you <laughs> sitting here, and, and we know we've got Happy. He's behind the scenes over here behind Amen. the camera. Um, and just the three of us. I know that, that you made decisions to give your heart to Christ, and that gives you the peace that you have now. I see you doing things with your life, even from death row, brother. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned to me that you just recently got a 501c. Yeah, kick Can up. you explain that to us? Yeah, so uh, Kingdom Minded Now Incorporated is um, a 501c3 purpose to be a channel by which we may um, disperse needs, ministry, food, shelter, whatever may meet, whatever may be needed at whatever place God calls. I mean, that, that's that's the main thing, being led where he desires us to go. Um, so one of the things, there's often people who want to help, and like, I receive three meals, like I have shelter, like I don't have any bills, we don't have any ministry expenses really, um, other than some theological books and whatnot, but we are blessed to have individuals who help us with that. And so the primary means for becoming a 501c3 is so that we can receive money on behalf of God's glory and use that to further his glory by attending and helping to individuals out there in the world and also in here because we have, as you've seen, we have uh, one of the facets that we have um, here is Heavenly Bread Bistro where Agape is the entree, where we serve weekly meals every week. And that's an offset of the Dark Pen Church in Christ, which is, one of, is the ministry that myself, Justin Underwood, Charles Crawford, uh, Roger Gillette, Eric Moffitt, uh, Stephen Powers uh, helped found uh, mm -hmm. back in back in uh, 2017, and so for for several reasons we decided not to make Darpen Church a 501c3, um, but for the the plans that that God has put in my life as far as my music, the dispersion of my project, the the other resources that God has given me, like it was a necessity to become to become a 501c3 in order to be. A legal entity if you will mm -hmm. um, and so that's the thing obviously that's not a necessity of doing ministry like we can still do that but we're not able to solicit funds and things like that and so when people ask if they can help we're able to say yeah you can go here and you can donate um, and so that's that's one of the reasons uh, just to support um, support that endeavor the, the ministry if, if the people were to watching this and they were wondering okay how does that look like if, if I'm an inmate here how can you from death row Help me an inmate here. Help another inmate here? Well, so there's there's a lot of ways. So for one thing that immediately comes to mind, so unfortunately when new people come to death row, as, a, as great as we are, to, as happy as we are to see them, we're also saddened by the fact that they're here. We don't want them to be here, but we are blessed that we are able to have this experience, learn, meet these individuals. And so a lot of guys, when they first come here, like they don't have anything. Like they just come with their clothes and what they have. And so they don't have the bare necessities, clothing or a sh a shampoo, soap, toothpaste, deodorant, stuff like that, food. And so care packages, a Bible, like we're able to purchase these things and keep care packages so that when individuals come in, we can provide these things then to alleviate one of the things that they have to worry about. We can't take care of everything, but we can eliminate some of the worries that you may have. Um, again, with the meals. 
you know, food, food is a necessity of life. It's something that we depend on, albeit we know that man may not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, you have some individuals who don't really get that yet. They don't understand that. And so using that necessity, that, that not form of life, but knowing that they need that food, we provide that food for them and they understand that, you know, for God so loved us that we also should love one another and that we do this as an act of love, uh, a charity. That's why when we say where agape is the entree, a lot of people misunderstand that. They think, well, you're saying where agape is the entree. You're just saying that's because the food is so good. It's like love. While that may very well be true, the main thing is that we're doing it as an act of love. That's, that's why right. we're doing that's it, because right. of love. And so that's those are a few ways that we're able to minister to the individuals here. We're also able, um, so we did an event uh, December 17th. Um, through American Family Association, Brother Will, Will Addison and Brother Abraham Hamilton III of the Ham Hamilton Corner. Uh, they came here, preached, preached an amazing sermon, First Thessalonians chapter 4, 9 through 13, about the eternal hope that is Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were able to eat food. We were able to have a, a, a nice dinner and whatnot. Um, and braces were given out. Um, and we're also planning another event for uh, the 10th of April, remembering the resurrection. And we'll also have food there, and we're also supposed to have uh, some gospel artists that are going to uh, perform, and we also have MP3 players that will be donated with gospel music, contemporary, classical. Mm -hmm. uh, That's good. I, I know that, uh, Parchman, how long have you been on the road, brother? Uh, March 11th will be 20 years. 20 years. You've seen the changes firsthand. I'm sure that you saw, um, you've seen different administrations, always going to be oh, different. Uh, yeah. As you've seen Burl Kane, um, take come in as commissioner, um, and Mark McClure, the seminary program startup, he's in all that start. Mm -hmm. Has that affected Parchman? Um, you've been there right through the middle of it all, and there ain't nothing y'all miss from death row. Y'all well, know everything that's happening. No, there's not, and, and I, I would say that I'm a little bit more privy or have a little bit more clarity or depth in my perspective because, as I said in my testimony, I went on a hunger strike in 2012. Corresponding to that hunger strike, I also filed a civil suit. I ended up suing Mississippi Department of Corrections for inhumane living conditions, and we ended up settling, which is where the basketball goals, the, the modified contact visits, the donations, um, the rec pen accommodations, a lot of other things came by way of that. Mm -hmm. And so my point in saying that is that in pursuing those legal claims and whatnot, it caused me to have to investigate. It caused me to have to do legal research. Gates v. Collier and the ACLU when they sued back in 2000, 2003. All of the things that happened, I had to, had to sit and look at the history and sadly, what was often bad faith practices by not this administration, but a, an, a, an, a, an, ad, an administration here. Um, the administration prior to this, um, seeming indifference, um, and I will say this, that a lot of the changes that I've seen here, I mean, obviously they're attributed to Commissioner Kane and, and also uh, Mark McClure, mm -hmm. superintendent, um, and also Reynolds, and, but also some of the other individuals whose names are not mentioned, like, you know what I'm saying, like Warren McDonald, like other individuals, mm -hmm. as, you know, it takes teamwork makes the dream work. Like it takes a lot of people to, to help things be what they're supposed to be. And so I think, I think change can seem seemingly stagnant at times here. And I think that has less to do with the amount of effort that individuals who want to change things are putting in and more so to do with the depth of the depravity and the problems mm -hmm. here. Um, I, don't think, I don't think Commissioner Kane's anticipation of how messed up the culture is here when he first came in because that's ultimately what we have. At the end of the day, it's a cultural problem. You have to change the culture. You can write policies all day. I would rather have bad laws and good people than good laws and bad people. You have to change those things. And the best way to do that is start working on the hearts of men. And I think, I think they get that. Yeah, definitely. You know, I agree with you, brother. I think that um, here we're seeing, instead of everybody focusing on the negative, this place got so much negative attention. Amen. As we focus on more positive things, I'm watching some of these field ministry brothers truly love on people. Amen. Amen. I'm watching, I went over in, um, to medical and um, one of the field minister, Jerry, and there's a man over there who's been here 30 something years who's dying. Um, he's in the hospital side and Jerry's his caregiver. And I kind of slid over there one day and he didn't know I was there. And brother, I mean, he's got natural life, multi-murders, you right, understand? Right. I watched him sit on that bed with that man and you couldn't, 
he couldn't have loved that man any better, any better amen. than yeah. he was loving him. He got to see Christ. Yeah, yeah. but through amen. Christ, brother, that amen. was the preach, amen. man. Amen. You hear me? Yeah, that That's amen. what I want this world to know, that there's, there's such that I didn't know that Jesus Christ was even true. I mean, I told you I didn't believe this. And now I've been out of prison a day or two and they're letting me back in. Right. To come and, and interview some more of my Full brothers. Circle. Yeah, man. Amen. Who but God could do that? Amen. Um, my heart right now goes to our nation's youth, brother. Um, Amen. Amen. I think about the way that, that we were raised. I know that you had a dysfunctional childhood as well growing up. I think you mentioned your childhood was kind of off the chain, as it was mine. Um, and it's, it, you know, I was using dope at 10 years old as well. I had two sisters that were older than me that were in the bars, motorcycle bars. So it just kind of, in 68, I was 10. It was a, wasn't going to say no to drug generation, but that grew. And um, as it grew, I thought at first it was fun, then it became bondage. Yeah. And, you know, I did, ended up with 22 years of my life behind bars. But you have, for almost that long, as I did, you've been sitting in at one place up there on death row. And I know that you, two o'clock in the morning, brother, you're a man just like me. And even with the faith, and I know God's good to us, but we're fleshly. And at two o'clock in the morning, sometimes that gets heavy. And if you could tell some of these youth that right now are in the mix, they still think it's, you know, whatever, that. But you're getting ready to have to pay with your life, brother. What would you tell that 17-year-old, 18-year-old that was you when you were 17 or 18, having fun, drinking, getting high, never realizing? Can you do something, offer them some kind of hope from straight from death <clears throat> row, straight to the brothers and sisters out there? So, so for me, I one one of the one of the one of the truths that I hold near and dear to my heart is, is the value of perspective. And that is so much of God's word we see is essentially that, you know, trying to change our perspective. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, do not, be do not be conformed to the ways of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the good and acceptable will of God. So perspective is primary. And the reason that I begin this with perspective is because not so much how we see one another, but how we see ourselves determines how we see one another, and more importantly, how we treat one another. And this is one of the reasons why evolution and Darwinism and other things are so detrimental. When we look at um, the Frederick Nietzsche's, when we look at um, Hitler's, when we look at oppression of a particular people group, whether it's slavery over here or, or, or Nazism over, over in Germany, whatever the case may be, we find these things fueled by pride and power and greed in these things. And these things are inherent in the heart of man. The Bible tells us that the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can understand it? And so when we, when we think about how wretched we are, when we think about how flawed we are, this is one of the dangers of, of evolution is that we are just products of cells or whatever that have come together and created this thing and over millions and millions of years we've become these these great creatures that now have names and can go in and order food from a fast food restaurant um i really i really struggle with that because what that what that does is it puts you on the same level as the animals which is why you have commercials that say give 25 dollars a month for to save the animals which is a good thing i'm not taking nothing away with that and then you see another commercial that says give five dollars a month to help the hungry children of the world where, 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 no, uh-uh, that's a little backwards to me. Human beings are the glory of God. We are, we are created by God himself in the likeness of man, in the likeness of God, we have been created. And so the Imago Dei, when I understand that my fellow brothers and sisters of the world, his creation are divine, that these inalienable rights endowed to us by our creator, what determines our worth as human beings? That is the question that I would challenge the youth to ask themselves. Is it how many likes you get? Is it how jumping your TikTok is? It is how many chains you got? How fat your wallets are? Well, people don't use wallets. Now we got stacks and racks. You know what I'm saying? Like we don't use wallets anymore. But at the end of the day, these things are temporal at best. 
These things cannot define you. If you let them define you, they will determine you. And that's, that's you know, we have to be mindful of how we see one another. Um, the, the, the various constructs of this world, racism, social construct, the black and the white. I'm not white. Him is not black. He's more melanated than I am. He's a darker shade of brown than me. Last time I seen tan was brown. Brown is a shade of brown, if I'm not mistaken. But the world, the culture, they want to, they want to divide. They want to separate these things so that, so that I can say this, I can say I'm better than you. We are all created in the image of God. We are all equal in God's eyes. Now, because of sin, creation is fallen. We are frail, if you will. Um, we are finite finite human beings we're limited in our knowledge and whatnot and our insatiable quest for knowledge I think gets us in, in trouble there's got to be more um, but I, I think I think that if we can if we can change and if each individual who's listening to me or watching this right now can really take an objective view and look at themselves in the mirror and ask themselves what determines my worth and what determines my worth can it do that or am I more than that because until you find out what your worth is, you will never determine anything. You will be determined by something. You will be subjective to something. And so finding out who you are, um, your identity, if you will. Um, my identity, first and foremost, is in Christ. That there is no longer slave or free, Jew or Greek, male or female. My chief identity is in Christ Jesus, where I am seated at the right hand of the Father. Everything else takes, takes a back seat to that. My manhood, my, my ethnicity, my classism, whatever you want to give it, they all take a back seat to that. Why is that important? Because being in Christ allows me to do what my, nat my natural self cannot do, and that is love and pray for my enemies. That's right, brother. And so the, the main thing that I would tell young listeners is to uh, ask themselves, what, what determines my worth as, a, as an individual? That, mm -hmm. that would be the main thing, and more so is, you know, Pay attention to what you think about. Pay attention to your thoughts because your thoughts will determine your habits. Pay attention to your habits because your habits will determine your deeds. Pay attention to your deeds because your deeds will determine your character. And pay attention to your character because your character will determine your future. So be mindful of what you set your mind off. Do not be a victim to a, well, he just made me mad and so he just made me shoot him. Don't nobody make you do anything. You are not a victim. You have the ability to set your mind, whether it's on things that are profitable or things that are detrimental. Set your mind on things greater than yourself mm -hmm. so that you can be greater than Amen. yourself. That's what God designed you to be. Amen. 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 That, I mean, that, that, would be, that would be the main thing. Just cha change your perspective and the option and the grace of God that you have to be able to do that. Um, and get a relationship with Christ. I mean, that's... That's the main thing. There is nothing, I'm not talking about religion, traditions, and all that. Have a relationship. Sit down and open this book that is still the most leading soul book in the world. That's still hotly debated, but it's still selling like hotcakes. Sit down and open up this book and get to know Jesus Christ. Ask him to open up your mind so that you may know the love of God that surpasses knowledge. That you may be filled with the fullness of God so that he may do uh, according to that which is able. But according to the power that works within. Like that's, that's, that's the thing, because I've, I've been on death row for 20 years. I have, I have tried everything. I've done coke, I've done weed, I've done pills, I've done anything you can possibly think of. Oh yeah, you can get it in here just like you can get it out there. Uh, everything I've tried, it. there's nothing new under the sun. There is nothing that I have ever tried that has brought me the lasting peace that Christ has given me. Period. That's, that's, Amen. that's it. I that's preach, it. brother. Um, good answers. These, these are good answers. Um, one thing that I'm impressed upon, brother, is that you haven't put yourself in a box of a victim mentality. I can see Lord, the God. spirit of my Lord inside you, and you know that you're, the Bible says, more than conquerors. Amen. And Amen. you found a place in your spirit. I know that that I, I often make this remark. I'm not leaving this world the way I came in it. Amen. Amen, Amen. brother. Amen. Because God loves you the way you are, but He loves yes, too much to leave you he that way. He got something else Amen. for us, like, yeah, do. Yeah, he do. I mean, and that to, to your point, like that's the thing. Like we're not purposed for this. We're purposed for eternity. That's like you're built for something greater. Mm -hmm. Why settle for something less? Mm -hmm. 
And I think a lot of times we settle for something less because we don't know any better. Yeah, well, that's our, and, our own ignorance. You know what I'm saying? And I, I mean, yeah, that's, there's, there's truth in that. I mean, yeah. not a short preach. I, 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 can, I can testify that myself. I just, you know, who we are, yeah. you know, the things of this world that, that influence, you know, um, one of the lessons that I, I learned a while ago, you know, that no man is above influence. Nobody. I don't mm -hmm. care who you are. You could be the president of the United States or a dude on the corner pawning for coins. You are not above influence. And so, like, what I take from that is because we can't choose whether we're going to be an influence, we must choose how we're going to influence. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to influence. Yeah, the way you way talk, walk, live, you're going to influence somebody because people are watching you. Mm -hmm. They're watching That's me. Right. They're watching you. They're watching you. But they're watching us. Mm -hmm. And so, like, we have to be mindful to set that example because, as we said, some people don't know what better is. We have to show that to them. We are responsible. As they said, I am my brother's keeper. Yeah, yeah. Amen, amen. I'm like, to, this has really been good. We could sit here um, all day, and I wish they'd let me brought a pizza. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> hey, bro, I'm, I got I, your cookies. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try a pizza but, next. But I'm, I mean, I'm grateful for this, because yeah. like. Oh, one other thing. Now, Ward McClure heard that somebody hadn't seen the grass, touched the grass in 13 years. And I heard that he opened up the back or somewhere and brought y'all from the road and let y'all walk in the grass or yeah. brought your watermelons. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was one of the things that, that, that did, um, uh, uh, well, at this particular time when we had watermelons and cupcakes and juice, we went out in the front of our building. That was mm -hmm. Deputy Warden, uh, Deputy Sue Reynolds. Really? He was one of the ones, but hands down, definitely to, to Ward McDonald, he has definitely been active in, uh, he was one of the ones that, that helped expand the tear worker program for Death mm -hmm. Row, allowing us to come out uh, two at a time upstairs instead of just one at a time. Mm -hmm. um, and like even now, like we've had day room call twice this week. Like the, the officer in the building, she called over here on her own volition, her own initiative she took to call over here. So like, man, we had, we had day room call yesterday. Like, I know we don't do this on Saturdays, but like it went so well yesterday. Can we do it again? And we awesome. came out again awesome. and we were able to congregate and yeah, fellowship. Yeah, and awesome. like, this is opportunity for well-being. I want to do home. a service over there on y'all block so bad, man. Yeah, that, that would be, that would you be know, dope. I want to. That would be let dope. me, brother, I will. Amen. You believe Amen. that, you know, I'll be there. Amen. That would be, that would be great. Yeah, man, that, that would be great. Hey, brother, just curious about something. 22 years, I know where you're sitting. When I saw you the first of my third time, and, and see, the way your cell sits, I look at the way y'all have church, and y'all have church in the bars, and, you know, the... No, no. Oh, they're letting you come out and have so, church so, in the... So, okay, so the ministry that we founded in 2017 is called the Dog Pen Church in Christ. The reason we call it the dog pen church in Christ is because the yard pens that they put us in, in individually look like big dog pens. And so before they started letting us come out, you would have me, if I'm preaching or if Justin's preaching, he would get in the center pen and then you'd have four guys in each one of these pens and then four or five guys on this and he'd be in the, he'd be, he'd be in the awesome. center. And so that's, that's how we've been doing that. But now as of late, because we're not having to go in the pens, we just congregate towards the end on the sidewalk. And so we sit in a circle. Much probably a lot like they did back in back in the first century church with Paul and them meeting around in homes. Like mm -hmm. that's that's more if you've seen little yeah, pockets. Yeah, about the pockets acts, so right, pockets, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so I, I think that that's definitely it's it's definitely good and I think I think there's a sense of revival, if you will, um, because it's it's you know, like Jabez our, our our territory is being enlarged. And so what will we do with these provisions? You know what I mean? And one of the things that I find confidence is, is, you know, in John chapter 15, he says, did you not know that I chose you? You did not choose me, but I chose you. Therefore, go for and bear fruit. Mm -hmm. And I, I often think about that. And God often says that in his word. He says, you know, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Think about the confidence we're supposed to get from that. Like, why are you worried? I chose you. Mm -hmm. That's like me telling you, oh, look, here's the keys to my car. It's filled with tank gas. Everything's good. You just go ahead. And you're like, man, do I get in this car? Dude, he just told you. Go yeah, ahead. Thank God. And so, like, one of the things that I'm mindful of is that in him enlarging our territory, like, it is by his provision that this, that this has been established. Right. And so, therefore, we should walk forward in a manner that is worthy of that calling in confidence that he has great things on the horizon for us. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, he would have never opened this up. The Lord in the first place. Right. That's right. He, don't he opens doors so you can walk start. through them. Amen. And so like being mindful of that and just continuing to stand fast and not be conformed to the ways of the world and letting the light of Christ shine 
um, and not being conformed to prison culture, taking the persecution um, that comes. Um, just, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not easy. Uh, I know, you know, martyrs and other individuals across the world who are doing missionary work in other countries, America has no idea what persecution is, which I kind of find myself sometimes praying for persecution in this country. Maybe we'll wake up. Because yeah. um, one thing that, I, that I've noticed is that where persecution is the greatest, Holy Spirit is moving the most. Mm -hmm. I don't care if parts of Ethiopia, parts of Nigeria, I don't care where you go. When you see individuals losing their lives for the faith, yeah. you see Holy Spirit moving. Yeah, it's fine. And over yeah. here, we don't, we don't mm -hmm. get that. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we, we, don't, we don't understand that. We don't know what persecution is. Yeah. So complacent, brother. Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, yeah. Amen. 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 Yeah. Uh, um, I've got a, um, a couple a couple questions. Okay. One of them is going to be, this just popped up since me and you were talking. Okay. You started talking about the church. Mm -hmm. Since COVID, a lot of the free world church, you know, they went to internet. Yeah. And since they've been able to come back, a lot of people have chose Stay not home. to come back. Yeah. Um, what yeah. would it mean to you, brother, to be able to go to a church? Yeah, that's that's so that's you see what I'm saying. One one of the things that you know, Hebrews chapter ten verse twenty five says, "Do not forsake the assembly," um, which is the habit of some, but all the more, you know, as you see the day quickly approaching. Again, he's talking about persecution. Times of persecution are a call for us to gather together. You know, there's nothing wrong with watching services online from time to time, but that can never, nor was it ever, purpose to substitute for the body. The body is a, is a living, breathing organism and is made up of human beings. When, when we come together, think about Ephesians chapter 3, it says that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints. Think about that, that there is a knowledge of God that is so vast that you need more than just one person to get it all. Because he gives you a word, he gives you a word, and he gives me a word. And as we fellowship, the glory of God is made manifest. So I may speak a truth to you, I may prophesy to you, you may prophesy to me. If we're not coming together, then the Christ in you cannot experience the Christ in me. And the church cannot be what it's purpose to be, a living building that is being built mm -hmm. to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. We're purposed to come together. Mm -hmm. What's sad about this is what people were dying for in the first century under mm -hmm. Nero about coming together, we're taking for granted for a sake of comfort mm -hmm. because we don't want to come out of our homes. Mm -hmm. People, people had become... I make up a word, homalized. I can't say institutionalized, but they've been homalized. homalized and we are, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I got a track called State of Hell Address that's basically, it's, it's, it's centered where basically Satan is giving an address, like the State of the Union address. Mm -hmm. He's giving a, an address to the Assembly of Darkness, if you will. And, you know, we have educated ourselves to a state of imbecility that no more in history have we been more connected while at the same time been so separated. We're isolated. Like that's why, like Satan, like we have to give them more devices so they can communicate remotely. Then we'll introduce them to porn and alcohol when they realize they're lonely. That's 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 the thing. Satan wants us to be by ourselves. And like I said, watching a, a sermon on online, there's nothing wrong with that. If you're trying to nourish your spirit on a Wednesday or, or whatever, like if the church is closed down on a Sunday or two, but that is never, nor was it ever, purpose to take the church to the place of the church. You're supposed to come to church to assemble with one another to encourage. How do I can't help you sitting at home? That's right. That's you know right. what I'm saying? I mean, kind of selfish thing. It, it it is, yes. and I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be unsympathetic to mm -hmm. the plight because there are some individuals. There is a real fear there that they don't want to get COVID. Some people have real sicknesses that makes them more susceptible to COVID, and like I get that. Um, and so there are certain circumstances that don't permit them to go back. And like, I get that. And God in his sovereign and his grace, like he yeah, understands yeah, that. Right. But if you're just choosing to abstain from the fellowship because it's com it's convenient, mm -hmm. yeah, sadly, not only are you not growing, but other people are not growing either because mm -hmm. that spirit that he's given you, which is purpose to work through you, is not really working through you. Brother, I would say that, um, that the pastors that will watch this interview that heard you just say that, you'll get a lot of amens from the pulpit. Now, they wish they could say that. Well, they can. Yeah, but it's, it's hard on a, a preacher to sit up there and put a congregation. It shouldn't be hard, no, but it, we're it, watching. It, it shouldn't. 
And, and you know, unfortunately, just we're going to talk real, brother. What is something I've seen is it seems like that for the sake of money, mm. Mm. people are allowing the wolves to come into the body. Mm -hmm. yeah. And wolves devour sheep. Yeah, there's, 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 uh, I just finished reading a book, you know, Go Along to Get Along. Um, like I'm not, uh, just different, different things, whether it's abortion rights, whether it's same sex laws, whatever the case may be, these things that are, um, perforating, like infiltrating the church, if you will, that, you know, like we're not far from the Bible becoming hate speech. Mm -hmm. We're not. Mm -hmm. We're. I mean, we've already seen in Europe and other places where they've removed pronouns from the Bible. There is no father. There is no he. There yeah. is no she. Uh, it's they and them. Um, like in again, what what the question that you asked me earlier? If there was one thing that I could say to the young men and young women out mm -hmm. there, what would it be? Identity. Identity. That's it's it's it, not only is it an attack on identity, so that you can be whatever you want to be. Ultimately, it's an attack on the family which as we know was the first institute God created. And he created it first because for a purpose, because everything else is supposed to be built around the family. That's why there's supposed to be a mother and a father. And that mother and father is supposed to raise that child, train him in the way that she, he, sh he or she shall go in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Mm -hmm. That is the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But all of these other ideologies, if you will, uh, I wake up today, I'm six years old, I'm a girl. And you have parents saying, okay, you wanna be a girl? Go ahead, go, go ahead. Give give him give him shots and do all of this type do all this type of stuff. While at the same time we're celebrating um, women's rights. That's the, the how how are we celebrating women's rights and we're trying to do away with the notion of a woman all together. What do you what how, how does on what planet does that make sense? Uh, Supreme Court justices saying I don't know what a woman is. What really? I, I just, I, there's certain things, but these things are infiltrating the church, and you have pastors who are not going to stand um, because they care about their bottom dollar more than they do the glory of God, mm -hmm. and that's unfortunate. And I'm not saying that you know we're supposed to say you know hateful things. That's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It's grace and truth. Mm -hmm. you, 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 it's grace and truth. It's not God hates this. God hates you. Like that's not that's not the gospel. Mm -hmm. That is not the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so, but there, there is, there is, there is a line that you must walk in the integrity of God's word that says, you know, that certain things are an abomination to him. Yeah. And if you suffer persecution, that then to God be the glory. Mm -hmm. For he who desires to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will That's be persecuted. Right. That's right. It's, 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 I mean, it, it is. We know what we know. No. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, and so like, I, I think some of the, some of the things that are, that are happening, you know, um, the, the uh, critical race theory. All these other things, racism, separating the denominations, Pentecostals, Baptists, Methodists, foolishness. What the heck are you doing? God, Jesus. Right. God, Jesus. We agree on the fundamentals. Come on in. Come on in. Yeah, that's right. Less right. melanated, right. more melanated, tall, short, fat, slim. I don't come God, on God. in. Come on. Jesus Christ was died, buried, resurrected from the dead. Yeah, okay, come on, on in. That's like right. we good. Like, well, you're not saved, you don't speak in tongues. Okay, that's a not that's a that's a negotiable. We can talk about that later. Come on in. <laughs> uh, like we're not worried about those things, but like all the division, again, Satan wants us divided. Mm -hmm. and he's he's a, uh, Satan is good at dividing. And he is. You made a remark earlier about the family and, and he's attacked. That's where he's attacking. Oh, definitely. If he, he knows that if he can intervene and, and divide that basic institution, that there's going to be young people that are raised without proper, uh, without having God's word, you without know, having a mother and a father. You know, and, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you something, and, and I, I was praying about this the other day, that so the image of man and men in our community, if you will, that, you know, have for whatever purpose, abandon their responsibilities, whether it be as a father, as a provider, as a protector, whatever the case may be. Because, because these individuals, I myself included, because I was one of them, mm -hmm. because we, that's better said, because we chose to abandon our position as a protector, as a provider, as a father, the woman has to step up. When the woman steps up to fill the role of the man, that role infringes on her role as a woman. Mm -hmm. And so we slowly lose sight of what the worth of a woman is. Mm -hmm. So be the best you can 
which is like a man. Be the provider because that's the standard. Well, what about raising my children? No, oh, no, no, no. You be the provider. That's what the man's supposed to do. That's the standard. So that's what we're going to do. To, to infringe on the identity and the worth that a woman has. A woman, <laughs> by virtue, is, is what, what does it say that, that uh, what, what, what did Adam say when he seen, why did he call, why did he call Ad, uh, Eve woman? Because when he first said, he said, whoa, man. You know what I mean? I mean, that, that's the thing. But if you think, like, he formed her right there by the rib because that's where she's supposed to be. And, like, a woman is not inferior to a man. She just has a different role. A man has a different role. Kind of completes each other. It does. It's complementary. This is not a battle. Absolutely. It, it, you know, it's crazy because a woman was created to be a helpmeet. Well, that's kind of demeaning. You know who else is a helper? Holy Spirit. Amen, bro. That preaches. Holy man. Spirit is a helper. Yeah, that preaches, is, my is, man. For it, real, that is, preaches. Is, is that, is that yeah. diminishing? Is, does that, yeah, does that take away your worth? Great point. God is a helper. Yeah. I mean, so I, like, yeah, I, chew on that for a little you know bit, what I'm huh? saying? Like that, that's, that's, that's the thing, man. Like I think no, society has, has tried to warp these perspectives. Again, it's coming back to perspective, knowing your identity, knowing your worth is determined by God. I know what God says I am. I know what God says my purpose is. What you talking about is secondary. I'll consider it, but if it's contrary to this, it's getting dismissed. Right. Stand on that. That's right. So yeah, that's, and then, and then. when we were talking earlier, um, and you, actually, is when you were um, you were doing. I'm gonna say a rap for better better words. I wish I, when you were telling me your life story. I like that rap. Just don't sound complete to me. That's more. It was deeper than that. But you know, I heard it. And you had to listen carefully. But I heard your story. Um, and you're not on death row because you sang too loud in church. You feel me? Right, you right. did things that you regret. Yeah. Um, you're a saved man. You and God's in your business. Right, right, right. I'm not here to bring any of that up, but I am going to ask you about something that I've seen hit home. Okay, okay. And that was your son. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've seen that hit home to you, and that, I'm dad that, too, brother. That's, so that's always that's always um. Yeah, that's always going to be um, probably the most difficult difficult thing. Brandon will be 23 in June. Um, he was 10 and a half weeks when he died. Um, and it's my fault. <laughs> like there's no, there is no, no gray lines there. Like it's yeah. not, like I didn't intend for him to die, but it was my actions that caused his injury that led to his death. And I can't take that away. Satan still tries to use that. Yeah. He still shames me. He still guilts me. The pain, that's why I say the, 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 the guilt and the pain, you know, the chains of those things have gone away, but the pain is still very much mm -hmm. there, and it will never go away. And that mm -hmm. is a cross that I have to carry. Yes, sir. I was not always honest about what happened to my son because I'm great with kids, great with kids. It was easy for me to say that I was asleep and... I accidentally kicked his carrier off the bed. And everybody, I'm great. Everybody knows I love kids, yeah. but truth be told, everybody knows that I have a bad temper and I've got serious problems. My mom shot heroin when I was in the womb. I'm Jack. I got issues. Got you, brother. I've got issues, got and that I'm not making excuses for what happened because I did that. I owned up to that. That was the biggest, the biggest choice I've ever had to make, and it has not been without consequences. If they walk me to 17, it may not be without that consequence. But it's cost me. It cost me relationship with my son's mother. It's cost me relationship with other people. But it gave me a relationship with Christ. Because I was able to come to him and give it to him. And he took me in spite of it. And gave me peace. It's a God who loves us, brother. He loves us the way that we are, that but something? he loves us too much to leave us that way. Ain't that something? And I, the peace that I have now and the love that I feel and those things I counter when Satan comes, I counter that with, with his love and his peace and yeah. that I am more than a conqueror, that nothing yeah, can separate right. me from the love of Christ, neither <clears throat> persecution, none, nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. Mm -hmm. And like 
all of all of the adversities that have been in my life, a lot of which have been my own doing, God has saw me through that and he's brought me out. He's turned, as Joyce Meyer says, ashes into beauty. Mm -hmm. um, and so my, my son, um, my son's name is Brandon. Who is Brandon? Brandon. Brandon. Um, Brandon Allen Bennett. Yeah, he's uh, he'd be 20. He'd be 23, June, June 14th. 23, June he was due, 14th. He, my birthday was, is on June 11th. He yeah. was due on my birthday. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, and God in his grace, if he sees, if he sees fit for me to have a, a second chance out there and uh, to be able to be, to be, uh, to have more children, because I'll, I'll always be a father, um, mm -hmm. as he will always be my son. Yes, sir. Um, but if, if, if he will, now that I know what love is, now that I am able to deal with my anger, and now that I've been clean and sober for almost a decade, now that, like, just now, now that God's glory is manifesting in and through my life, mm -hmm. like, I can be what I wanted to be, a long time ago, and that is a good father. Yeah. I'm, I'm able to. Be too, right? Yeah, I, 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 no question. You are a good father. Truth be told, I, I was, I, I just, I was not, I was not ready. Like the environment I had him in, the drugs, the guns, the everything that sure. just surrounding that was just a remedy for disaster. But God is faithful. Yeah, He is faithful, and yeah. He's continued to do that. And so I'm, I'm grateful. I, I will say this: that next, next to Next to the loss of my son, the, the, the heaviest thing on my heart concerning that is, is my son's mother. Because she's, she's expressed to me that she's, she's told me through tears that she knows that I love Brandon and that, that even though this is my fault that I never would have done anything intentionally to, 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 to kill him. No. She still, because, because she now knows that it was my actions, it was not an accident completely. Like she knows, like she has not been able to come to the place where she can just deal with me. Right. And so one of the things that is heaviest on my heart is for her peace. Yeah. Because I have caused so much pain in her life um, outside of Brandon, just being a trifling, <laughs> sorry excuse for a man, yeah, cheating good. and lying and manipulating and just yeah. doing what- Doing what we do, man. Yeah. Out there, yeah. And so I have done a lot of damage to her and my family, uh, but her especially. I am grateful that I still have a relationship with her grandmother and other people in her family, um, but I just, I want her to have a spirit of forgiveness so that she can have peace. Yeah. Um, and that's just an, another thing that's, that's really heavy on my heart and continues to be a, a, a continual prayer and supplication before the Lord. Um, well, we'll continue, um, and people watching this, as um, Christ song and, and as a, as a ministry, we have a lot of followers and um, we tend to pick up people that are genuinely um, sold out Christians, just been that way for a while. And we've got a lot of us women to pray, man, when it's a prayer warrior. So Amen. Amen. We'll just have them start praying over that, that um, over um, your son's mother. I, I just speak my faithful followers, like I, anytime I have the opportunity to do this because I'm so I am so grateful to, <laughs> I'm first and foremost, I'm grateful to God because it is because of him that these individuals were brought into my life. Will and Miki Addison, who were the founders of Urban Family Talk, who brought me Pastor Miles McPherson, who brought me the sermon, who ultimately led to me coming to Christ. Um, as they know, I am eternally grateful um, to them and May their treasures in heaven be rich and abundant. Um, I'm just thankful for them and all the work that they do through American Family Association and Aaron the Addisons and the Rock Church in San Diego. Um, I'm just grateful for them. I love them and I pray for them and just, yeah, grateful. So we can, um, we can, th we can find them at the Rock Church in San Diego to be able to, if I wanted to get well, a well, copy of the interview to them. Yeah, Pastor Miles McPherson, he's the head pastor of the Rock Church in San Diego. Okay. Um, Miles McPherson. Miles McPherson. Pastor Miles, man. Used to, play for, used, good to, people. used to play for the Chargers back in 86. Used to play with? The San Diego Chargers. Really? Yeah, used to play, yeah. Yeah, matter of fact, his, his brother was a, a world-class boxer. Like, his whole family, and he's awesome. Awesome brother, man. Awesome brother. Yeah. Uh, but Will, Will and Mickey Addison, they're host of Airing the Addisons, which is a, 
um, radio program that comes on American Family Radio Monday through Friday. Yeah. Um, and so you can find them at American Family Radio uh, with Will and Mickey Addison. They used to have a network called Urban Family Talk. And they ended up on 98.3 down here. And then they ended up converging because they were a sister network of American Family Radio. Yeah. And they ended up converging. And now they just come, they come on American Family yeah. Radio. I want to say bro. something to you as a minister. This just hit me, and I know my daddy's voice. I Amen. don't know how this works. I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm super spiritual and all that, because you know, just a hard head been saved by grace. Amen. Amen. But somehow, brother, in the madness that was once known in our lives, your life, Amen. Amen. and what you've described to me, somehow, God's going to bring all that back together. I don't know what that means, but I feel it just Amen. like Amen. it's already a done deal. Amen. I agree. I agree. You agree. Yeah. I don't know exactly how or when. I but know, man. I don't quite know how neither, but I feel that. And that's okay. You said there was a division of, I feel a drawing back of. Well, I mean, well, I mean, I mean, I see a division, you know, in the body, which is certain, certain ideologies and whatnot, yeah. uh, things trying to infiltrate, but like, with 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 me, like I definitely feel feel a drawing. Like I mean, every day uh, is an opportunity to draw closer to Christ, and that that is like there's yeah there's no I, I see I see I see great movement of Holy Spirit mm -hmm. specifically in J building, um, and I think now that we've we've realized that it's not about how many people, um, it's it's who is faithful. You know, it's not our ability, but our availability. You know, just being able to, right. to, to come with one another. And those brothers, as he told, uh, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he says, you know, instruct and teach these to faithful men who will carry on. You know, few are called, many are chosen. Many are called, few are chosen. Mm -hmm. And so just being mindful of that and continuing to be um, present with those who have that desire to delight themselves in the Lord. That's that's definitely a good thing, but I, I I'm I'm like you like I don't I don't know exactly how he's going to do it, but I mean the worst case scenario is, but a door to my favorite lover, like there's you know what I mean like it okay. it you know what I'm saying it doesn't it doesn't matter when you understand what awaits you, yeah. like that removes the sting of sin that that removes yeah. death like it doesn't it doesn't matter yeah, and that I think I think, truth be told and this is a hard truth. The difference between individuals who are sold out for Christ and those who are living mediocre lives, they still fear man. Mm -hmm. They still are afraid of death. Mm -hmm. If your chief aim is to glorify God and you are eager for what awaits you, it, do, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. When you move in love and the sufficiency of his grace, like it doesn't matter mm -hmm. what man does. What can man do to me? Mm -hmm. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Come on, let's go. Yeah. There's a, a line I wrote in to, to a song. It says, uh, uh, there was a man that, when I was in Attica, and I met his brother, his brother was on the low security side, and his, his um, the man that I met, but his brother, this man's brother was still behind the wall in Attica, and this man was 75, 80, and he just lost his brother, and the chaplain um, said, can we pray for Brother Bradshaw? And when he said, yeah, said that he just gave, gave him a death notification. I saw him sitting there. His hair done went to white. I mean, old black man just had his Bible and um, been saved for many years. Good right. soldier. And so a, a song hit me in these words that no more chains weigh down my body. No more paying for my sin. There's no more lonely nights walking, six steps turning back again, because we're standing on the mountain. On the real side, me to you, right? I mean, I just met you, you just met me. You know, I'm prison minister, you know my past. I, and I'm not, I told you I could, we could have traded places. Yeah. So that appreciates you feel me, but I mean, I mean, it didn't. Right. So with that said, if somebody would have come to me and give me this opportunity, and, got, and I was able to get off the road right. and come over here and they put these cameras in my face and it was another ex-convict. Right, right. And he looked at me and said, Bobby, you look at them cameras and for the next however many minutes, you got something on your heart. I don't care, I'm not gonna ask you a question. I'm gonna say, is there anything before we leave here that 
we can use this venue to get your voice from here to there. This is your time, and you have complete well, liberty, brother, if you right. get mad or start tearing some of us up or cussing or <laughs> we landed it out. So, so, so first and foremost, you know, what I'm thinking about is prayer. Like, what I'm going to do, I'm going to pray. Um, if it's what I'm going to do, I'm going to pray. Because that's, that's, that takes it out of my hands and puts it where it's supposed to be in his. And so I want to pray for the viewers of this in real time so that when they, when they, when you guys hear this, um, that this prayer, this prayer is for everybody that's listening. Amen. And so I, 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 I want to pray. Yes, sir. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your sovereign, for your benevolence. We thank you for your mercy, your grace, your love. We thank you for your steadfast and immovable Holy Spirit. Father God, we thank you for being mindful of us. We thank you for remembering us in our lowly state, Father God. We thank you for before the creation of the world that you made a way for us to be reconciled. You made a way for our sins to be atoned for and for right relationship to be had, to be experienced with Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, where we are seated now at the right hand of you, Heavenly Father. I wish this day we cry out, Abba. Father God, this day you are mindful in your omniscience that you know the ways of man, you know the frailties, you know the hurts, the pains, the, the ills, the woes of, of the listeners and the viewers of this right now, Father God. You, in real time, uh, can touch their hearts, Father God. I pray that their hearts may be receptive in a spirit of humility. I pray their hearts are receptive, that they um, may feel the pressing of your word against their heart, Father God, that your righteousness, that your hope, your eternal hope and your love may impress upon their hearts your eternal truths, Father God, that they may have a light inside them, that they may come to the realization that they are more um, than what they are right now, Father God, that there is forgiveness at the cross, that you came to die for us, Lord Jesus, that you, hallelujah, made a way for us, that we can be redeemed, that we can be reconciled. Father God, I just pray relationship. I pray um, that, that they may know what forgiveness is, that they may experience forgiveness this day. Father God, I pray that you will give them clarity. I pray that you will bestow your knowledge upon them. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will move in their hearts, Amen. Father God. I pray Amen. that you will give them um, a perspective of not just who you are, but also who they are, Father God. Who have you created them to be, Father God? For your word tells us, and we hold it fast, for we know that it will not return void. Father God, your word tells us that you know the plans that you have for us, plans of welfare, for, for our well-being, Father God, not for for dest not for us to be destitute, Father God, but you have a plan for us, a plan for your glory, that this may be manifested on this earth as it is in heaven. Father God, again, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for the brothers and the sisters that have made this opportunity possible. Father God, we give you glory this day, Father yes. God. We pray your protection over this ministry, Father God. I pray that it will continue to go forth. Father God, I pray the doors will be open. Those that have been shut, I pray that they will be open by the power of Jesus. I pray that anything that desires to come up against this, we bind this in the name of Jesus. May the blood wash away uh, any evil that comes against, Father God. We just pray in the mighty name of Jesus that these things will not stand, Father God. For we know that Satan's weapons will form, but we know by the power of Jesus they will not prosper. Amen. Father God, the last victory, the victory that is Christ, has been given to us and it is ours. Amen. Father God, the revelation that is the gospel that is Christ Jesus, we hold fast to that this day, Father God. And we thank you for your glory. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for all that you are, all that you have done, and all that you continue to do. We praise you and we give you all glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Let the body say amen. 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 So from Bobby and Christ's song, um, my brother Devin, and here at Unit 29 at uh, Parchman, Mississippi State Prison. Amen. Let's see. I'm going to get it right. J Block, which also known as Roe, Devin and his brothers. Amen. The Peace doctor. out. Amen. Peace out. Peace out. All right. Good interview, brother. Likewise. God bless you. I appreciate you. Thank you, brother. Likewise, brother.